I see it is you've got two choices. You can either keep pretending like nothing bad's ever gonna happen to you, and then when it does, you're saying, uh-oh, or you can get ahead of what's coming so that when it does, not if, you're ready for it, and you're sitting pretty, sipping on Mai Tais next to the pool, working on that Caribbean suntan, because you got it covered. So folks, it's time for you to learn the truth about money. It's time for you to take back control of your money so that you are ready for what's about to happen. By doing that, you're setting yourself up for absolute success. No matter what comes your way, you're ready for it. And that's what I want for you, and I wanna help you with that. So go to chrisnoggle.com and sign up for the Wealth Webinar. We do them every Wednesday at 1 p.m., and you need to be there because it's time for over 90 years, we've been crash testing our cars in the tireless pursuit of automotive safety. At Volvo, safety's been first since 1927. We've saved millions of lives with the invention of the three-point seatbelt in 1959. At Volvo, we've made driving safer for you and them. Visit safety.finlayvolvo.com to learn more. So they say if you give a man a gun, he'll rob a bank. But if you give a man a bank, he'll rob everybody. The good news for you is Private Money Club runs solely on peer-to-peer -peer relationships, which means no banks allowed. So finally, there's a community for real estate entrepreneurs where it is truly a win-win solution. This community is a place where you can connect with other lenders and other borrowers, and the end results, massive growth for you. You get to build your real estate empire, and you get to do it solving other people's problems. So if that sounds like a place you want to be, well, then join us. Go to privatemoneyclub.com forward slash Kelly. And if you want 500 bucks off, just add the code Kelly500 and I'll knock 500 bucks off the premier membership. We'll see you on the inside. Welcome to the Kelly Cardenas podcast where attitude is everything on today's show. I'm so excited to be able to have this young man. Um, I met him as a friend and I had no idea who he was, but I saw his heart right off the bat. He was constantly like asking me about who I was, what I was doing, and he was shining light on every single other person. It freaked me out though later on when I found out truly who this guy was. He was one of the top jockeys in the whole entire world. And when I say that to him, he's like, no, no, I was only number two. I wasn't number Number one. And I was like, most people never get the opportunity to even be in the conversation, let alone in the top 10, in the top 100. But this guy was number two. He had a 35 year career, over 10,800 races, 10,846 to be exact. You'll probably correct me on that one because he probably ran one on the way here. Um, he had 10 or 1,061 winners and uh, 52 tracks and purses worth over 17 million dollars. It's amazing to be able to have it, uh, have him in the studio. But also for me, the honor is, is the fact that, again, he's always looking how he can serve other people. He's looking to be able to take his career, which is one of the top level professionals in his craft, and be able to shine light on everyone else and draw out the greatest in them. So please welcome to the show, Mr. Jockey Joe, Joe Steiner himself. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to be here. <laughs> It's great to see you, my man. So uh, tell me to, like, I know that you were telling me uh, earlier, you were at 99, uh, 999 races. Yes. I and was, you wanted to go back to the other. Yeah, I was, I was stuck at 999 wins. And for some reason, I was, I'm trying to get to 1,000 wins. And it's, it's a big milestone. And at the time, my wife was pregnant. Uh, we were, I was racing in Southern California here. Um, riding at Del Mar and Santa Anita, and I kept finishing second for like a month straight. So um, I started thinking, you know what, let's, let's put ourselves in a good spot for this great occasion because my wife's about ready to have our son. And so we went up to Seattle in the Northwest uh, where my mom and dad have the racetrack kitchen at Emerald Downs, and I was riding at that track up there called Emerald Downs. And the very first horse that I rode, it won, so that was a, my 1,000th win, and my whole family was there. My wife, you know, big as, as she can be. Um, it was it was an amazing day, and it was it was the just the, the place to be for that moment. And then soon afterward, we were in the hospital room and with a long labor, and there were all all of my sisters. My sisters were there. My mom and uh, her Dagmar's sister was in there also. 
And it was kind of a long labor, but next thing you know, he comes out, my little son Jonah, and it, it was, it was, everybody was laughing, and it was just a great time again, and uh, this spiritual, magical moment. So it, it was great times. So Joe, a thing that you told me, or you talked about just a second ago, was the fact that in the event that you would have played or you would have uh, been competing at a different time, there would have been, as you said, you're a very humble guy, but I, I loved it because you said there would have been utter domination. There would have been a situation where it, it, people wouldn't have competed, but that time that you were in, that when you were racing was your time. And you have been in a place where what I think what's been amazing to me is Timing for you has been everything. And you told me a story the other day about, um, we were sitting at, uh, at the counter, and you told me a story about how if this didn't happen, then that wouldn't have happened, and it actually started your career. Can you share that? Yeah, that, that actually is a, a very powerful tool that, the, of an experience of mine that um, I didn't really realize until later on. So um, I'm five years old. Uh, my grandfather was a jockey. My uncle was a jockey in, in the horse racing world. And, and, and now I'm five years old, and I was at the races up in Seattle. And I looked up, and there was a horse going out to the track with my uncle on it. And I said, that's what I want to do. I knew what I wanted to do when I was five. So fast forward, I'm 12 years old. And uh, we lived in a, in a farm area up there in Washington State. And the neighbor says to me, hey, would you like to learn how to ride horses? And I said, absolutely. You know, that's that's what I want to do. So I was going down the street, and I was going to this guy's farm, and, and me and another kid were going around the shed row, learning how to jog horses, get a feel for the horses. And after about a week, um, this guy put his arm around me, and he says, hey, uh, we need to have a little talk. And I said, okay. And he goes, um, he goes I'm looking at you, and I'm looking at th this other kid, and he goes, I can only focus on one guy. And he goes, um, I'm afraid that I think you're going to get too big. I looked at your parents, and I go, okay, well, then that was that door got shut. So the next week, I was at the track working for my grandfather, grooming horses and taking care of horses. And a little guy came down the shed row, and he walked up to me, and he was my size, and I'm 12, and I'm so I'm this big, right? And How said, tall are you at this time at 12? Uh, at 12, I was about 4'11". Okay, so most people, so this is something that most people don't uh, uh, ever experience. When you said, oh, he might get too big to do this thing. Yeah. My son is on the opposite side. He wants to play quarterback, and his sister's giving him a hard time saying, oh, you're at this height. But it's such a, I mean, that's something that, were, were you nervous about that? Were I, you nervous about getting too big? I, you know, a, a little bit I was because, um, okay, let me finish that story real quick too. So, yeah, because I, I was because I was growing still. I mean, I was, I was growing. And then, I, and then I had that question in my mind, am I going to get too big? And this is a, a thing that we don't know. I mean, your, your body's going to do what it's going to do. So, um, okay, so anyways, this little guy came down the shed row and he goes, he says to me, he goes, as soon as you learn how to ride, you come down and see me. And he lived in Southern California. His name was Johnny Longden. And turned out this guy had won 6,000 races as a jockey, and he was a trainer at the time. So, and then fast forward again, now I'm 15 years old. I end up down in Southern California from Seattle because of the, the doors that have closed. Um, I end up at his barn. I end up getting on horse for him. Next, you know, as a 17-year-old, I was second in the nation as an apprentice rider. So, um, I mean, I went from, from maybe not even being able to be a jockey to being second in the nation. So, um, and so now I'll go back to Johnny Longden in 1912. He was with his family and they were going to catch a ship and they got there too late. They're in their car. And as the ship was taken off the Titanic. So that was another, um, you know, just these things that these doors that have closed that at the time you're thinking, why is this happening? But it was all, part of the, the big blessing that's going on every you're always in the right place so I've always been in the right place and I you know will continue to share that story so um but yeah anyways going back to when I was racing I I had to fight my weight hard hard because it, it's all about weight it's all about um at, at the time when you're an apprentice rider you, when you're first starting you have five pounds less than the guys that you're racing with 
So like these old professionals, that, and they were Hall of Famers, like Lafitte Pinkai and Chris McCarron and Bill Shoemaker. These are all the big name guys that were at that period of time that I was racing. So, um, so I had a five pound advantage over them. But it, at that at that cost was I had to be lighter, and my body was starting to grow. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, I might get too big. And but anyways, I I um, I just I was blessed for some reason. I stayed my weight my weight stabilized, and I was able to do this. As and I'm tall because I'm five foot five. For um, for a jockey, it's tall, but it's all about being light enough. So I was able to do it for thirty five years. So what kind of training do you have to go through? Because I mean, not knowing that world, we look at it and somebody. I mean, you have to be in elite shape. But how do you train for what you're doing for that for that profession? Well, it's you know, it's it's all about being in the right mindset is the biggest, the biggest key is, is, um, cause the fitness comes along with riding the horses. I mean, when you're riding the horses, you develop the muscles that you need, you develop the instincts and the, um, just everything is just from riding. So then to enhance that, you'll go to the gym and, and add some muscle and <clears throat> some core strength and stuff like that. So a lot of core strength, but the, the biggest key in, in being successful at I believe anything is having the right mindset. So that was Mm -hmm. my, that was my main thing. And my main goal was to try to stay even keel. And that was the the hardest part because there's, there's more lows than there are highs. So to stay in the, in the middle ground is, was the key, you know, and and that's what I try to help people with in life because it, life's a roller coaster, you know, being an athlete's a roller coaster. I mean, the, the highs and lows that go along with it. In in, in my game, if I was to win a race by a nose, I would be like, my God, I mean, off the charts. But if I got beat a nose, I'd be like off the charts feeling like, God, what could I have done differently? What do you say to the person, the novice, right? So there's a lot of people out there that maybe don't know horse racing. And especially like, you know, our friend Greg Reed, who you took to the race, uh, you took to the races a couple of times Mm -hmm. and you show up with you. And when you show up to you, it's like going to a basketball game with Michael Jordan. That's what I want people to understand. And he does that, but there's intricacies of the sport that we don't see. We're just looking at, okay, um, I, I had someone take me to the track one time, and I said, how do you bet? And they said, well, we got to walk out, and we got to look in the, in the paddock, it's called. Look in the paddock and look at the horses. But it's not just about the horses. Am I correct on this? No, it's not about just, just about it. The horses are the vehicle. I mean, they have to be in the right place because, and, and, and the trainers that are, that are grooming these horses to get to the races that day have to have everything right. So it's, it's all timing. Um, it's all, you know, like for, for the races, for the, for the horse has is, is been prepared for months to get to that one moment. So the, everything has to be right. They have to be peaking at that very moment. And now the jockey has to be in the right state of mind when he comes in because his energy is going to flow through to that horse. Um, so there's, there's the component of the horse being in its right zone and the jockey. So when it, when it all comes together, that's when you get the win. So is that the difference between the nose? Like, what, like uh, we've talked about it before on the podcast about professional athletes and the difference between a, a home run and a foul ball is that much. The difference between a quarterback who has the physical ability, right? Exact same stature, everything the same. And then the guy who wins the championship, it doesn't have to do with the fact that that guy was that much faster. What's the nose difference in horse racing? Yeah, that's a that's a good question because it it, it the nose difference is, it's just your energy. I mean, it's your positive feeling that you're unbeatable. You're un in defense, You're like um, nothing can stop you. And that, that radiates through. So that's, and that's the state of mind you have to stay in. But <laughs> you, if you consider there's 12 guys in every race with that same, same state of mind, and you have to be that guy and, and win that race. But if you don't, then you got to come up with that same state of mind the next race, the next race, the next race. How do you forget about it? Like people will say it, and it sounds easy, um, have a lot of confidence, a short memory. But when you win by a nose on high, like you said, you lose by a nose, you're deep in the valley. Yeah. Like, how do you bounce back? Take us into that moment. Maybe take us to a time where you lost by a nose. When was it? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I've, and I've had quite a few. Um, the, and, and in those cases, I'll just, 
in, and I've I've learned because I w- I've, I've started with the best. I rode with the the most experienced. Uh, I mean, we're talking legends of the time um, that I was able to start with. So they taught me the skills of how to how to not let that affect you. And and really, um, that's that's a that's that's a thing that can like I'll see guys that have great talent, and, and it could be in any sport. Um, but if if you have a bad day and you're off and you and you and you bring that, well, that's the difference between you and the next guy because the next guy, like me, it's not going to affect because I'm I'm just going to go okay well, well we'll just write that off, we move on to the next and just keeping that steady attitude that's what's going to take you there. So. How, what are some of the practices that you put in line, and where did that killer instinct come from? Were you born with the killer instinct, or can, can, you, um, can you develop it? This has been a question for me my whole entire life, like that it factor that you have. You have the it factor. To be the number two jockey in the world, and, and uh, let's put it in perspective, number two professional athlete in your craft, like that's unbelievable. Is that born in? Is it from your environment? Is it something someone taught you, or is it something that someone drew out of you? That's a good question. I, I think it's something that I had in me already, and I didn't I didn't gain this from my uh, mother or father or my grandfather. It's, it's something that I wanted so bad in, in in from the time I was a small kid. So I think I just took all the the pluses from the the guys that I looked up to. And that's where I kind of I kind of got my level in my own self. So where did you like? What was the motivate? Did you see a picture of somebody? Did you go to a race? Was there a time where you you know you were at the track with someone and then you said, "Oh man, I want to do that." That was that was like when I was five because I mean when when I was five I looked up and I see my uncle that was on a horse as a jockey and I thought you know what that's that's what I want to do, but as but for that to all happen it was nothing could stop me because. If I look back and I, if I watched myself when I first started getting on horses, as, like as a 12-year-old, um, and I wasn't a natural, but if I, you wouldn't tell me that because um, I, I believe so strongly that nothing was going to stop me. Was there something that made you mad? Because sometimes people are fueled by, oh, this happened, or maybe I was shunned in this, so I'm going to show you. Um, you know, was there a moment like that for you? Yeah, good question, because um, like I said, with, with him, with this guy shutting me down, saying, hey, I'm sorry, I can't help you out. I think you're going to get too big. Was that part of the fuel that, that made me say, you know, I'll prove you wrong. Um, but I did have that. Um, and, and as, as now I'm going to fast forward to another experience that I had, um, I, was, I was invincible. I was racing around. I was, I've been racing for five years and I was winning on a, on a high rate, and I was, I was cocky. I was, I was like nothing could stop me. And I mean, I just, I was, I was exuding this. Um, nothing could stop me. I was in, invincible, and nothing could hurt me. And then all of a sudden, I had an accident. Horse fell, and I got hurt, and I ended up four months on the shelf. And I broke a, a lot of stuff. I broke my collarbone and some ribs and some things in my neck and my knee and my foot on opposite sides and people said I heard these people talking behind my back they said you know what you'll never be the same he's going to be scared and I go I'm going to prove you wrong and I and I and I said you know there's there's no way that I'm going to be scared so I came back the first two horses I rode I won and then um I was riding and and so my confidence got right back where it was and now I'm racing in, in uh, Northern California, and I won the first race, and, I, and it was a long shot. So the next race, I'm on the favorite, and it went over the rail. And I ended up in the hospital all night long. So turns out I'm okay. They, they said, okay, I was strapped to a table all night long. But turns out I'm all right. So the next day, I'm in a race, and I'm going down the backside, and I'm behind horses, and the guy in front of me got too close, and he fell, and I fell again. He got the wind knocked out of me, and... Then I was, I was, they go, you're all right? And I go, I'm all right, I'm all right. So now I'm in the race again, and I'm in the starting gates, and I'm sitting in the starting gates, and I'm thinking, what if this horse falls? What if that horse falls? What if something happens? I started freaking out. Now fear set in, just what they were talking about. A friend of mine saw this, and he said, you know what? I, I'm watching you. I saw you out there. I, I need you to read this book. 
And I'm like, okay. And it was Unlimited Power by Anthony Robbins back in 1986. And it was 1987. So anyways, I read this book, Unlimited Power, and I learned some skills. And I learned, I learned that I could take these, these thoughts that were going through my mind and I can take them and make them small and make them explode and get away from me. So I was able to get back in that mindset of fearlessness again. So this is part of the tools that I had to learn along the way, but that was one of the, Anthony Robbins has been a huge part of my life ever since. Let's go back to the, the over the rail thing because you said over the rail and then you just moved on. Okay. For the people out there that, that don't understand the terminology, and I think this is a big one because vocabulary and vernacular of a certain culture, whether it be horse racing or it be financial world or real estate, a lot of times it's a barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So when I was listening to you, I heard over the rail, and I was like, okay, w what does he mean? Good question. Yeah, because I, I get it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're over the rail. So what, was ha what happened is I was on the horse. He was running down the back side. How fast are you going? 40 miles an hour. 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going 40 miles an hour, and I'm on this horse that's supposed to win, and he decides he wants to jump over the rail. So he, right, I'm right next to the rail. He just, just jumped it, and I end up in the center field on my head, and um, that's what happened. And when I said he jumped the rail, he jumped the fence. So you basically had a motorcycle crash at 40 miles an hour. Yeah. And landed on your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so then I ended up on a wood board, strapped tape to my forehead, just like that, all night, x-rays left and right, and it turns out I was all right. So the next day, I'm back out there again. So like I said, in those days, they, I mean, if you had, if it, these were like in the 80s, um, nowadays, they, they have a lot more, you know, <laughs> protocols, protocols. Yeah, protocols. yeah, yeah. Um, like, you have a concussion, you know, but at that time, you're, you're all right? Hey, I'm all right. Back out there again. So take us to that, mo that, that time, because there's a lot of talk about, say, like NBA. The old NBA, you would literally get knocked out as you went up for a layup. In today's NBA, if someone even comes close to you, they don't, they, they won't, uh, they won't even call it. But... Take us to the differences in the 80s, mm -hmm. you just alluded to it, right. to now and the people racing today. And I mean, obviously we're excited, we're, we're happy because people are safe. Yeah. But some of the times the people aren't going through the things that you went through. What was the difference? Yeah, they, the time that, that I came along, there were less uh, safety measures on, on a lot of stuff, you know, whether it be the horses, the 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 rails that we have around the racetrack, the safety vest that we wear now, um, the safety helmets, so those kind of things. But still, it's very dangerous. You know, even if you have a full body uh, protective thing on you, because if, if a horse is running and falls, you're rolling at 40 miles an hour. And if somebody ro runs behind you and happens to step on you, then you're going to get hurt. So, Joe, take us to the mindset part. You said Anthony yeah. Robbins, uh, you know, a, a large portion of it, and you talked about the mindset. Take us to how you can take a thought process or a, a, a memory or a, a, a reoccurring thought and how you can make that small and move it out. Yeah, that was, that was a huge skill that I had to learn. And, and uh, um, for me, I, I kept having this in, in my mind. It's like, it's like I, I have, if you have a negative vision in your mind and it keeps coming to you big, and you keep seeing, like for me, it was horses falling or somebody stepping on me or something like that. Um, and they kept coming. And then I was like, what if this happens? And then, my, and then, I w and then it was stopping me. I was freezing up because I couldn't, I couldn't get out of it. Well, that's, that's why I realized that uh, for in my work game, it was a five-year experience, a five-year career, because fear is the, is the stopper of, of, of that, you know, because you have, you have to have no fear. So for me, I realized that. I, I realized this is what's going on. Now I see what they're talking about. But what I did, I would take that, that vision that I had in my mind and I would make it big and I would look at it and then I would make it go up into the sky and get smaller and smaller and it just it explode. I just let it explode away from me. And if it came again, I would do the same thing over and over again. And pretty soon I, I didn't have these come into my mind. And if, and if I had negative thoughts, I would just steer clear of them and just not, not let them get in my mind. Cause what were some I of the, what there. were some of the foundational things for you at like growing up that maybe 
an uncle, uh, an aunt, a dad, a mom, a grandparent, whatever it was that, that helped you when this, when these type of concepts came in for them to land on the right soil, because you could plant the greatest seed in the world and it doesn't have the soil won't grow. So you said that it was just in you, but were there other factors around you that, that helped to be able to cultivate that once the seed hit you? Um, I, I think it was just all the, the timing of where I was. I mean, that's kind of uh, the, the fact of it. It's like I always ended up in the right place for some reason. It's like I feel like somebody's been behind me every step of the way. So everywhere I've been, um, not re even realizing it, I end up in the right place. And then it was up to me to bring out my best. Tell us about another time where, you know, the stars had to align for you to be in that spot. Because it seems like every time that I get a chance to talk to you or spend time with you, those kind of things happen. Even the other day, we were at men's group, and, you know, there's a guy there talking, and he was talking about something that was strong. Mm -hmm. And you were there to be able to comfort him and, and, and talk to him about it. And But share with us maybe a couple other stories, you know, specifically throughout your career that, if this wouldn't have happened, then that wouldn't have happened, and that wouldn't have happened, and you wouldn't have been in the place. Yeah, that's okay. Let's see. Um, I don't know. I've, 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 it seems like I. It, okay, here's another interesting thing that happened to me that that was was kind of like. I'm trying to. I'm still trying to uh, reach what this really meant. Um, I was racing in in the Seattle area. I get at this at this point. Um, and my grandfather, who was a trainer, had a woman come to the barn who was a medium and could read people's futures and find out different things. They also, she worked for the police department. She found people that were dead. I mean, all kinds of stuff that she had this connection with. And she was talking to her horses, and she was, she was speaking with different people. They were my family, relatives, and stuff. So she gets to me, and all I'm thinking in my mind is, I want to be leading rider. That's all I want to hear. And she says to me, you should have been a preacher. And I go, okay, that was so far off. But this is what I, as I go along, uh, everywhere I go from these 35 race, oh, every, actually 35 years, but uh, 52 racetracks, for some reason, everywhere I go, I'm, I'm meant to elevate these people everywhere I go. So I've, I've continually come across people that I, I feel like I've touched their lives and helped them elevate and feel better and, that, and this is something that, I, that I've that i found uh, through my journeys that I'm, I keep touching and helping people wherever I go. So I'm going to continue on that. And that's what, like something like this it, it helps me to get out there and have more in, um, in that direction. So why, is it so, uh, why is it so important for you to, to lift other people up when most people, elite athletes like yourself, and the, the, the top, top, I'm not talking about just like you're good, like, I mean, Joe, you're one of the best in the world. And when I say one of the, there was only one other one that was better. Right. Most of the time, it becomes about them. Those kind of athletes, that kind of alpha, that person up there, it becomes all about them. I have never seen you ever show any of that. And again, I've got to watch you when you didn't know I was watching. I've got to see you interact with people. I've got to see you lift people up. I've got to see you look people in the eyes and actually listen to them. Like, why is that important for you to give back and to be able to lift everyone else up? That's a good question, because um, I because I really don't know. I mean, that's what, that's what I'm really I'm trying to tap into it because I feel like I have a gift, and I feel like I that for for me, um, I do know these guys that are it's all about me, and that's it. I am number one, but I am number one. But I want to, <laughs> I want you to feel that in yourself. Yeah. Well, it's so Beautiful. that's so unusual. Okay, so let's let's flip it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that I'm gonna I'm gonna actually put the camera right on you. We're okay. gonna put the camera right on you. I want to watch. I want everyone out there watching. You can hear my voice, but you can see Joe, and Joe's just about to change, and I know how to change him. Okay. Okay. I'm a young jockey. You now are my mentor. I'm a cocky kid coming in. I've got the height. I've got the weight. And I'm starting off in my career, and I'm going to listen to every single thing that you say. What do you say to me? First of all, first of all, I would take away the, the cockiness, because I like I like 
So I like that, but I wanted to be more behind the scenes, like uh, that confidence that you have, but not being cocky. Because for some reason, um, in, in like I think I see this happen in, in anything. Like confidence and cockiness is is great because people are like, wow, that guy's confident. He's he, but it also is something that people want to take down. And people, when as soon as you get up, they want to see you fall. So I think if you have a more humble character, creating that humble character is going to take you a lot farther. Because I feel like um, when when someone is so cocky that people like to to take that away, and and that's one thing that I don't like to see is is uh, when when someone gets on that level. Um, I f- I feel like people. I mean, they don't respect it as much. So I feel like being more humble is is a very important thing for anybody. Joe, do you think that you could have competed at the level that you did without a cockiness to you? Because you even said, like, I saw your your demeanor change earlier when you said, like, you know, I was going. I was doing it. It was about me. I was in this place. When you see people at your level, the elite athletes, the top at the top of the food chain. And again, you just, and I love it because I said number two and you were like, nah, I was number one in the world. Like you knew it and you said it. Can you achieve that type of, of the success in that, in that realm without having that, that killer instinct? Can you, can you do it or can you do it humble? I think so. I, I, I did. I mean, that's, that's the way I, I felt. I felt as though it was humble um, I feel as though that that it's um, um, for me. It seems to be a better state of mind to be in, you know, because because of the highs and the lows. Um, I you know, for me, timing wise, like I said, I came around when I came around. It's like being in the in with all the best actors in the world, and I was just another actor. I came along with the t- the best jockeys were fifteen Hall of Famers, and I was this kid, and and I was in this in this room with all the best in the world. But if, if I would have came along at, let's say, 15 years later, it would have been a whole different, with my believing in myself. Because like I said, nothing could stop me. And when you have that, when you have that belief in yourself in, in that you can do whatever you set your mind to, that nothing can stop you, then I think you need to be in the right environment to really <laughs> make it excel. Um, but... I, for some reason, and, 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 and which I'm thankful for the environment that I was in. I mean, I'm, I feel so blessed that, that I was able to go in that era that I was in and, and, um, and carry on. For some reason, I feel like it's sti- now life is starting for me after I've been through all of that. Wow. Yeah. So my, my, my son asked me the question the other day. We're standing on the sidelines, and uh, we're watching a game. And he said, Dad, would you rather be a starter on a team that lost every game and ball out, or would you rather sometimes ride the bench on a winning team? What's your answer to that? Yeah, I would rather be the, the, the guy out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by far, and instead of being on the bench, because um, that's, you know, that's, that's, what you, that's what you need to do. I mean, you need to be out there. I mean, you need to you need to bring your game in, even if you're finishing second. Let's talk about the pivot, because I think this is a place where a lot of people re- will resonate. Is yeah, you were in a profession, fortunate enough, and hard work, talent, all those things aligned, right, to be the best in your industry. And then there's a pivot and a shift. A lot of times, people go into a dark place in this because they used to be. Right. I talked to Greg about this the other day. I said, was there ever a time when you repelled money? And he was like, well, it was when I uh, had a bad case of the Eustas. And I said, what do you mean? He said, when I uh, used to say, I used to do this in my business, I used to do that. And he was looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. How do you deal with a pivot when you've been at the top of your game and you're shifting into something else and now you're having to put in that work at a different level? Yeah, and that's... That's the part that that um, I've struggled with because after my career ended, you know, which in and it's ended many times, but finally, because I mean, because of injuries, and then then the one point, the doctor says you're done, you can't race anymore, um, and I then I came back six years later after that was said, and then I decided once I was racing, and I I came to a point, I said, okay, now it's my time, and I hung it up, but 
with that being said, now who am I? Because mm. this is, I mean, I've been this guy for 35 years. This has been my career. Well, now trying to figure out what is the next part of this chapter of, of life. And this is where a lot of guys run into, could be alcohol or other types of things that come in into your life because you've, you're always chasing that. You, you've lost that that you had, that, that, that who, that fame, that mm -hmm. all that excitement that goes along with it. Um, and that's a huge, huge loss because the, I know I know a lot of um, people in my industry, and I, I see it's the same with anybody. I mean, with with any sports star, with anybody that's in that's been blessed enough to do something they love to do. Now to try to find that afterwards is what it's been one of my goals is to figure out what I need to do so that I can help other people in the same case because I feel like that's that's what's going on with me right now because I am. I'm stepping into that, these shoes of, okay, I'm, I'm meant to come and help these other people with their lives because I know, I realize there's a lot of people that were in the same spot that I was, blessed to do what they love to do. They can't do it anymore. Mm. And now who are they? Well, they got money. They got, or they don't, or they whatever, but there's a big hole. And that big hole needs to be soothed and it needs to be it needs to be communicated with and look something to look forward to. We need we always need a, a, something in front of us to go. All right, I got this to look forward to. You know, and, and your health is number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, having your health. And so this is another thing I got into is, um, well, about seven years ago, with all my broken bones, we're forty one altogether. Um, I got into a thing called Beamer, which is a medical device, and it kind of keeps it keeps the blood circulating and helps the body heal itself. This is another thing that I promote and that I'm a distributor of, so people can check with me on that too. But between your health and your mindset, mm -hmm. these are the things. So now you got to find what what is there something out there something out there that you can be attracted to that that keeps you that fire burning. Well, you just, you just talked about it. Like you, you talk about your health, right? So the physical right. part and then the, the mind, um, how do you heal your heart in these kind of things? Because I think a lot of times guys have, uh, or women that come out of professional sports, especially at an elite level, they come out of it and they have a hole in their heart that they're trying to fill. And you said, sometimes they fill it with drugs. Sometimes they fill it with alcohol. Sometimes they just fill it with accomplishment or whatever it is. How do you fill that hole in the heart? I feel it. I feel it by, um, for some reason, I feel it by helping other people, and it's 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 a a crazy rewarding feeling that I get because there's there's a lot of people that I feel like I can affect in a positive way. So just by talking and letting people talk and letting people just speak their hearts, and sometimes just being able to talk. And there's nothing I do is I'm a mindset coach, but um, working with people and letting them speak and letting them kind of open up and just. Sometimes you just need to open up and just and just let it out, and and it will take you out. Okay, you know what? Things are okay. I'm all right. I feel better. And this is always something we got to work on because it's an everyday process. What are some of the th the principles that transcend um, horse racing and can transcend into anything? And the reason why I say this is because with me starting in the professional beauty industry and starting as a hairdresser, these principles. My dad taught me principles. There was one business in the world, one business only, and that was the people business. Take the people out of the business. You don't have no business at all. That's right. That was a prison, uh, principle, right? Uh, he also said to me, um, you never know where someone's from. You never know where they're going. You never know where you'll meet up again, so make a friend out of everyone. Those were principles that I was able to apply in the professional beauty industry. It worked. Um, but then there was things in the professional beauty industry that I thought that were just for the professional beauty industry at that time. Number one. Um, it was making sure that the person for, felt amazing, greeting them, saying hello to them, thanking them at least three times when they were in. Number two, future pacing them, future pacing them, talking to them about whether it was if they sat down for a haircut or whatever it was. I was talking about the things that I also wanted to do or could make them feel better, right? And services that I had. And then from that point, once they, we engaged in the service, then I started future pacing about when I was going to see them again. When I see you in six weeks, this is going to happen. And then I took my business and I wasn't about going out and getting new customers. I was just in rebooking the guests that I had that, that day. And that person that had that experience, my dad taught me the 10-10 rule. The 10-10 rule was for every one person that you saw, 
either 10 came from them or 10 went away from you because of him. Mm-hmm. So every person that I saw, what I wanted to do, my aim was to be able to get 10 people from that one person. Plus just rebook them. So now 11 people are coming in and I never had to go out and promote. What are some of the things that will transcend? If we just went to horse racing and you talked about the mindset part of it and getting into that, that no fear. If you take us through that, what principles transcend into anything that someone was doing that started in horse racing? Yeah. Um, yeah, because I, the, the thing is that I, that, I, that I see through my experience is that I, I do relate to any, anybody in every, in every sport and any walk of life. Um, but what is it that transcends to everything? I, th- I think um, I just, just having that, that um, the grat- the being great, grateful for everything you have and, and having that mindset right from the get-go um, every day that you get up. And um, I don't know what else I could really, because I know, I know what I got. Well, take us to the pen. Like, take us to the pen. When I say the pen, it's probably not called that, but I'm saying that. So take us to, like, most people will never, ever in their life get a chance to feel what you felt sitting on top of the horse, thoroughbred, in the pen before the race actually starts. How do you get prepared? You said mentally, right? And the mindset. Get us prepared right now. Take us there. I'm climbing on. Where do you have to go in your mind? I have to go. I have to go into a, a relaxed place, um, and I actually put myself. Actually, I look at the, the the finish. You know, I look at the finish because, for me, um, the win is what we're all about. I mean, we're always looking to win on whatever we're doing. I think you you have to have that winning mindset. So. I would envision myself that I was winning um, the race, um, and that's where I would get into that that quiet zone and just get myself relaxed. And um, would you see yourself when you said you, you envision? Do you see yourself crossing the finish line on that horse, or are you looking at the actual finish line itself and and just vi- envisioning crossing over it? I'm actually envisioning seeing myself do it. And, you know, kind of uh, that's a good question because is, is am I seeing myself do it in my mind, watching myself and the horse in front of me as I go, go past the wire? I'm actually seeing it from a side view uh-huh. of myself riding to the wind. That's so, how I, that's how okay, I so it. we've got that that vision. Yeah, then the you vision. get then you get set up. You're on the horse, right? You're yeah. in that calm state of mind. You've already seen the finish line. As it's coming to you, because you know when it's about to go. Is it a is it a sound that is going, or is it a green light? It's a sound. Okay, it's a sound. Yeah. You know, and you can anticipate that sound because the jump is going to be a big thing too for you yeah. guys to be able to go. What's going through your brain at that particular point? It's it's um, just that that confidence that I know it's going to happen. You know, this that I think just just believing so strongly that this is just going to happen. So I, th- I think it's the, the energy that I put into myself the, that's exuding out. What about halfway through the race? Halfway through the race, maybe you're ahead behind. Yeah. Okay. What starts going through your brain, or is it just happening so fast that it's muscle memory? It's, it's all instinct because, like, I, and preferably I like to say, like, lay about third in a race because I like to have the guys in front of me. And instinctively, you know, it's like you're driving in a car and you're anticipating what driver number two in the lane up ahead, gonna, they're going to do this. And you're always watching. And you, but, but for me, I have to feel what I have underneath me. What, I, what do I have here in myself and my horse? What kind of energy do I have left for the finish? And what do the guys in front of me have and what kind of energy have they used? And do I have enough to tackle them and take them out of the finish? So that's my whole feel is, is, is relating to the whole environment. So I, I guess you could equate it to as someone driving down the freeway and anticipating what you have. Like if you have a four-cylinder car or an eight-cylinder and what you can do or a guy in front of me, what, what, what are they doing? And you're always anticipating the move, but mine was always to figure out what I have for the finish 
to make sure that I get there first. So take us to that place where, okay, this is, this is amazing because when I'm thinking about transcending principles, you're giving it to us right now. First of all, it's calming the mind, right? right. Calming yourself. Right. Second of all, seeing your end result, like seeing the finish line because we're there to win. We're there, not there to compete. That's yeah. what you said. We're, we're only there to win. I we're mean, only there to win. We, we only want to win. Okay, so calm your mind. See the finish line. You're only there to win. So get in that mind state. The second or the, the, the fourth one confused me though, Joe. When you said, I lay back. I, when I start off, I lay back and I want to be in third. In my head, you just said win. I'm thinking, nah, man, we want to go. Right. But what you said is like, let me lay back. Let me see the competition. Let me see what's happening. And then I'm going to make my move. Take us to when you make the move. Yeah, so for me, I mean, every every scenario is going to be different because I may be on the lead or I may be last or I may be in the middle. Um, but like I said, ideally, I like to I like to lay about third. I like to let the other guys do the pace running and, you know, set the pace and, and me sitting there relaxed, waiting to pounce. So knowing what I have, knowing what I have, and knowing what they have. So that's that would be my... Take us to the pounce moment. Take us when when it when it, when it's go time because there's and, and I didn't realize that there's that point in the race. Oh yeah. I thought it was no. You just run as hard as you can. This is what the normal novice is is thinking. Take us to the pounce moment. Like what? what how do you know when to kick in, and when do you know it's right? That's you know, and, and for for me as much as I did what I did, um, sixty seven thousand horses that I've ridden in ten thousand races, but there, between all that experience, it, the instincts became like you walking or anything that we do instinctively. We just do these things and we don't even realize it. But um, for me, it would be like um, if I was in a, in a race and I was laying third. And the guys in front of me, and I, and I could feel exactly what I had below me, even though I've never even been on this horse. A lot of times, I've, I, I wouldn't even have this connection, except for right then. I would make that connection in the paddock. When I see him for the first time, I'd hop on the horse and make this this instant uh, energy connection. And we'd go out there, and, and I would feel exactly what he had and exactly what they had. And it's all instinct. So instincts plays a big part, and that's repetition of anything that we do. So now let's go to the finish line. As, you're, as you make your move, and then as Jockey Joe does at so many points, <laughs> you're going to the win. Like there's a lot of people that are like, I tried. No, no, but I mean, it's, it's proven. I, 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 I set out your stats. I mean, you, you won over 1,000 races. This is amazing. 1,061, I believe, or 1,066. Right. Um, Take us to that, that moment where you know, like even though the person's close, you know what is going through your brain at that point as you know that you're going to win and then you're crossing. At that point, I, I just have this, it's like a huge body smile, you know, of, the, of that confidence because I, I know I'm just going to get there by a nose. And that to me is like, it's it's a it's in a feeling it's a feeling that um, that I, that I always say if if I could just capture this in a bottle uh -huh. and 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 just say here I want you to just feel that because what it just happened for me in that in that emotion that I that I ex that I'm experiencing it with that with that win um, is weeks sometimes months worth of work and it's people that are involved and it's this horse that's laid his life on the line for me and that is is like this high that's off the charts but like i said that if you can if you can not get up there because of that and stay here that's what i always try to do is mm. stay right there but it, like i said if i could just capture that 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 in a bottle and just have you have a little sip and give everybody a sip of that man i i just wish i could share that but it's i guess um, I felt the same, almost the same emotions when, when Dagmar had Jonah, you know, mm. that was off the charts. So that's, what I think it's what everybody is looking for in life is that, 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 wow, that was incredible. That feeling was amazing. And we're always chasing that great feeling. Are you of the mindset though, Joe, to 
not go so high. My brother tells me this all the time. Like I'm a, I'm a high and low guy. Like I'm a, like a mountain and then like the deepest, darkest valley in the whole entire world. And he's like, bro, you need to calm it down a little bit. Like, you know, we need to have a little bit more even kill. And I'm like, dude, the mountaintop was awesome though. I mean, the valley sucked, but is like, are you of a mindset now of no, I would much rather just have it kind of smoothly transition or is, is Jackie Joe still going for that? Like, Hey, I want the, I want the nose. I want the nose. I, I always want the nose. You know I mean? That's, that's, <laughs> I, I think that's what, what, I mean, in life, we always want the nose. You always want to win by a nose. You don't want to lose by a nose. So, but like I said, if, if you can, if you can get yourself in a, in a, um, in a, in a, a place where you are just so thankful. Okay, gosh, I'm, I have, I can breathe, I can see, I can. I'm so thankful that I'm here, in 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 whatever thing that you have to be thankful for. I mean, just that. That's where you need to keep yourself, because that's the humble. That's the humble place, and so when you get that nose, you're still at that humble place. And if you don't get that nose, you're still at that humble place because there you have all this. I mean, think about the principles, right? Think about the principles that you just laid out. I can't wait for your book to come because like for your book that is going to be written, I'm calling, I'm calling the shot right now. Okay. First chapter is going to be about calming the brain, getting into the pen, right? Second one is going to be able to see the end before you ever get in. You should see the end. Third one is going to be see yourself already crossing the finish line and being the baddest man on the planet like Jackie Joe, right? Fourth one is assess the field. Don't be so quick to try and jump out in front. Lay back a little bit, preferably third, like Jackie Joe wants to be. Right. Assess it, know what's under you, know what's inside of you, and then know when to pounce. And at that pouncing moment, understand and trust the vision that you already saw. And then enjoy that victory at the highest level and share it with other people. And then guess what? This is the part that I don't like because I'd like to just stay at the top of the mountain. Yep. But then for you, what you just talked about was regenerating that and helping others to be able to see it and starting that process again, calming the mind down. That's where you, exactly where you went to. But that's where I got mad at you, Joe, because I wanted to be like, no, let's, let's, stay in the, <laughs> let's stay in the celebration, man. How do you get other people to feel that? Like, say with Dagmar, with your wife. You've been married for 10 years. She's absolutely beautiful. You married up, too. You outkicked your coverage. I want to let you know. That's why you should wake up grateful every single day. You've got a beautiful wife. You've got an amazing son. Um, but how do you, in your marriage, help Dagmar to feel that winning by a nose feeling that you got to feel on the track in your marriage? That's something that, um, that in, in your relationships, anybody's relationships, you always have to analyze what, you, what you're bringing to the table for them. And because that's where the compatibility and the, like for, for, for her and I, it was, it was like... Um, when they said you, when they say to you, you'll know when you meet the right person. That's what happened with her. When I met her, I knew it wasn't like I had to go. I wonder if she's the right person. She was the right person. So, knowing that and seeing life as it comes along and the roller coaster of life, which we all go through, sometimes there's little valleys that I can say, hey, you know, I can see this. I can see something that I can. I. I have a little more experience than her, but I mean, with with life, I'm a little bit older and, and all the stuff that I've been through, but sometimes I see things, but sometimes I have to let things happen for appreciation to occur. So sometimes we have to, sometimes we have to experience a little bit of a, a down to appreciate the high that's on the other side of it. What would you say to Jonah if he said, hey, daddy, I, I want to go into the family business? I, I, I want to, I want to go there. I want to be a jockey too. Where would you, I mean, or would you be excited about that? Would there be things that you put in line with him or are there things about the industry that you would say, uh, I mean, I want to, I want to pump the brakes on it. Yeah. And you know, if, if he decided that he wanted to be a jockey, then I would steer him in the right direction with the right people. Okay. Um, it's about, it's about who, you know, in life, <laughs> uh, it, it really is. It's about who, you know, um, and it's about making the right connections in, in that in the field that you decide that you want to get into. But 
uh, horse racing is not really going in the right direction um, these days. So it's, it's, thank God he's not going in that direction. And um, I, I actually w I'm thankful that he is more of an engineer minded kid because, um, you know, it, like I said, it doesn't matter what, it, what if somebody loves something, then I would 100 percent support it, you know, with him or whatever direction he's going. He's more engineer minded. Um, uh, in my case, growing up in, in the horse racing world, my poor mom and dad, I mean, the, if they would be watching races. I'd be somewhere and then down I would go and they would be not knowing what happened and uh, so much pain that they had, uh, you know, feel because of what I went through. So I'm thankful that he's not going to do that to me. <laughs> you know, like they always say, when wait till your kid grows up, they're gonna, <laughs> you're going to get what they you did to them, you know, uh, your, your mother yeah. would say to you, yeah, yeah. you know, but... Um, but I'm thankful. I mean, no matter what direction he, he decides or any kid decides to go, you want to support that and you want to at least or maybe tell him why they should or shouldn't. But in his case, um, he's got a more of an engine, engineer minded type of thing going on and, and which I can't even relate to. But um, he's he keeps putting himself in the right environments and that will be his thing. So, um, like I said, for some reason, it's it, it always comes in where you you're you're where you need to be yeah so so jonah i mean it's it's incredible his personality is phenomenal we got a chance to be able to talk i gave him a sprite so he likes uncle kelly now um mom said that he's only have uh, allowed to have one every now and again but um yeah. every time he comes to see uncle kelly then uh, he'll get to have he's, one he's good. um that means mom just said <laughs> like he's not coming to see uncle kelly that often um <laughs> So how do you tra how do you transition though as a dad because when you are an elite athlete like yourself we talked about you have to have a killer instinct you're a humble guy but I I want you to go back in this episode and watch yourself when you said pounce when I said pounce take me to that moment you shifted in your chair a little bit you yeah. sat a little bit different and when I said when you go and you knew you were going to win your body language changed like the way that you, I don't, Dagmar probably saw it. She knows it. Yeah. There's that killer instinct in it. How do you shift gears into being a dad and not put that type of pressure on your kids? Because I see this happen a lot. Right. Where the the dad or the mom is an elite performer, and then the kid comes along and the kid's like, ah, I, that's not really my style, but they're forced into it. Yeah. And and that's, uh, unfortunately, that's. That's uh, not a good thing always because um, if if someone's feeling that pressure from their from their family that they're expected to be this, I see a lot of times they go the other way as they get older. So this is something that I've seen through my journey. I think no matter how successful someone is, is always to encourage and support um, and not push the envelope on them and not not say you know I'm expecting this. But, you know, some kids respond better to that. I don't know. But in my case, in, in my experience with most people that I've come across, which is a lot of people, um, I think just being supportive of, of in helping, you know, coach them in the right direction. And, and you know, hopefully they find something that they have a passion for that they're going to go in this direction, whatever it, it may be, um, not expecting your child to be in what you did as, as a successful person. Um, and not also spoiling them because you don't want them to go through what you went through either. So there's a there's a, that fine line because um, I see that a lot. People that are very successful um, don't want their kids to go through what they went through because it, it's never easy. I mean, it's always a challenge. And, and any any successful person, um, they've been through the the roller coaster of life, and and um, to be successful, sometimes it's not always a great thing on the other end of it, but, um, and you also don't want to go, oh, I don't want my kid to experience that, and, and so I'm going to give them everything, and next you know, they go south, so y you want to keep, you want to keep the focus on, um, you know, keeping them going on with, with their goals and their dreams and in their life, too, so I mean, that's, that's a very, very uh, powerful thing that I've, that I've seen so many times, and I, I, I feel bad because, I mean, I feel like I, I see that uh, somebody will have a, a child and, and they've, they've been super successful and then their kid just turns out to be uh, kind of lost. And, and, it, and I feel bad for that because I think it's kind of up to us to help guide our kids and give them the support and, and give them their platform 
in whatever direction. It may be something all the way off what you're thinking they should do, but you know, as long as they have that that uh, that dream, that's that's what we all we all have to have that dream to 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 succeed and and keep looking forward to tomorrow and getting up going, yeah, God, I feel good. I'm so thankful. Gosh, I got I got these beautiful people in my life, and I'm gonna keep attracting them. How'd you keep getting up during your racing career? How'd you get up when you didn't want to? Because I would like to think you're a, just a superhero, and every day you just want to wake up and train. Uh, you know what? I did. I, I, I was, it, it was amazing because um, early on, I mean, I had a smile on my face all the time because I was, I love, even if I got dumped in the mud, I mean, I would just think, man, I love this. But as time went on, life started happening and you know just what it would be uh for me injuries uh things like that it could be it could be girls it could be drinking or it could be whatever happens in your life these little things as you get older it becomes a little harder to deal with keeping a good attitude so um for me it was um for some reason i was meant to go through this um experience of injuries and um, relationships, um, and, and trying to figure out where I needed to be and being with the right person. These are all, these are all the beautiful things that I like to help with other people because I know we're all going through this. How do you find that person that you want to be with? How do you, how do you put yourself in the right place? Where is that? You know, where is, is it, is it in this state or is it in another state or is it, uh, with this type of person or, I mean, or I think we're all searching for that that thing that that just fits, and you're like, oh, you know what? I just put this hand in my in this glove, and it and it fits right. But sometimes it takes a lot of uh, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way, and getting back up, and going, you know what? Nothing's going to stop me because I know I'm going to put my hand in that glove, and I'm going to find that right person, or I'm going to have that feeling, and I'm going to keep working towards it. So, and it'll make it contagious. So I think one of the things that I've heard that, that really impacted me was if you ask the right questions of the right people, you get the right answers, right? You ask the wrong question of the right people, you get the wrong answers. Right. And so it has to, those three have to go together, right person, right question, right answer, right? What do you wish more people would ask Jockey Joe? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good question. Um, how do I f how do I feel, even keel? How do I get myself in that place? Because I mean, for me, it's and it, and it came back to there was just a, a short, quick story. Oh, go go! All right, so there's a, an old wise trainer. His name was uh, Charlie Whittingham. He was like a really famous guy. He was bald and he didn't say a whole lot, but he goes, and this is where I got this from. He says to me, you know. You shouldn't be able to tell whether a guy just won a hundred grand or by a nose or lost a hundred grand or by a nose, meaning a hundred thousand dollar race, which was a big deal in the day. Yeah. Um, which is not as big a deal today. But that really resonated with me. And I was only young, I was probably eighteen at the time, so I thought to myself, how can you not feel off the charts when you just won a race, a big race, by a nose? And how can you not feel below ground when you got beat this far? Everything went right and you got beat this far. And when you get beat that far, you don't even get noticed. Nobody, would, nobody says anything, but you win on the other side of it. The crowd's roaring. The, the, you know, the emotions are off the charts. Everybody's like so happy and you are. And it's only that much that caused that. So in life, how do you not, and how do you stay here? And that's my my thing is I I want to I want to stay there, and appreciate. Wow, that was awesome. Or dang, that was a bummer, but it's okay. We got tomorrow, and we keep looking at tomorrow. What has Jonah taught you in your life? Oh, he's he's taught me. We teach each other a lot because. Um, He's, he's just, um, he, he's his own little person. That's what I, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he really is. He's, he's, he blows my mind. Well, he speaks German, and he 
speaks English and he's a, a whiz with electronics. Like he takes speakers apart, puts them together again and gets them. I'm like, he made a box, cut these holes, put these speakers in, glued the whole thing together and then plugged it in. And I said, Do, wouldn't you want to plug it in before you glued it all together? But he plugged it in and the whole thing worked. And I was like, okay. So anyways, um, just his determination and knowing that nothing's going to stop him. So, and that's the same thing that I had. And I think that's, that's a key is like, if you, if you feel like, God, you know what? I love this, whatever it may be. Nothing's going to stop me. Even if someone says to you, you suck. You really have no talent for that. But if you believe that in your heart, that, that I, you know, nothing's going to stop me. I, and I, and I'm going to, I'm going to be good at this. That's that's a huge gift. So he has that. I had that, and I think uh, a lot of people get discouraged when they when they don't have. Because I would even as a as a coach, I would see talent. I could see riders. I could see people, uh, whatever. Because I work with all all sorts of athletes, and sometimes you'll see somebody that you think, gosh, you there's no talent there, but there's this and there's this, and when you have that. Nothing can stop you, and that's that's what I had because I really wasn't a natural. I was I was just nothing was going to stop me because I knew I loved this. So, Joe, how do you know when to listen to that person? Because we hear that you know in life, like you know, if you believe it, don't let anyone stop you. Sometimes there's that person that comes in your life and tells you some truth and says to you like, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, and and. We don't listen to it, and then we run into a challenge. How do we know to, how to decipher that and when it's true belief or when it's we're trying to tell ourselves something? Because there's uh, my, my, my mom taught me this, that you could do anything that you put your mind to. Right. But just because you could do it doesn't make it your purpose. That's right. How does a person understand what their actual purpose is and then go towards that? Because there have been times where I've thought that I should be doing this, and then I focus on it, I lock onto it, and I beat my head against the wall, and the wall does not open up, and the door doesn't open up, and the window's not there, and then someone comes along, and it's like, hey, dude, you shouldn't be doing that, and I want to fight them, <laughs> but when I listen to them, I'm actually able to move forward. How do we know the difference? I, You know what? Honestly, I think that we need to do that. I think that we need, <laughs> I think we need to go down. I think sometimes you just have to go down that wrong road because you're thinking, I think I love this. And you go down and you're like, man, I suck at this. And I really maybe need to change my path. And that's part of, that's part of life. I think, I think we, you know, we, we can't all be so blessed that go, oh, you know what? I, I have this passion and that's it. Thank you, God. Everything's perfect. <laughs> you know, it's not like that at all. So if, if you feel like, you know what? I, I think I have a passion for this. Go for it and, and give, it your, give it your best. And if you suck, keep on doing it. And if it doesn't work out, it's all right. You get back up, you find something else to do. So, I mean, it's, there's, it's not the end of the world. I mean, because like I said, no matter what we do, no matter what down road you go down, it's going to be all right. When's the last time you tried something and sucked? Oh, real estate. I got it. Real <laughs> estate. I, it, the, the sad thing is, you know. No, no, you're not glazing over this. Help us with yeah. this because we want to know that Jackie Joe is, we want to know that Joe Steiner, the Joe Steiner is a human being. You just said real estate. Yeah. And you sucked at it. How bad did you suck? Was it was it kind of suck or was it pretty bad? Uh, you know, the, the thing is, every time, <laughs> every time I got hurt, I was thinking, what can I do to make good money? Okay. And I'm not going to break bones and stuff like that. Well, I got into real estate and. I made some investments and nothing turned out good. So, I mean, I, you know, I made poor investments. And, uh, did you know they were poor, like right when you oh, made them? No, no, not at all. Did you, did you have that, I had that, that, that jockey mindset? Oh yeah. Of I'm going. And this is going to be an extremely successful adventure. Did you, did you use your own principles of, you know, calming your brain, seeing the finish line? Did you sit back in third to make sure that you knew when to pounce and then you pounced? Or did you just go headlong into this real estate I thing? Went, I went headlong and see that. And I didn't apply my, <laughs> my, my knowing skills. Because if I would have, 
honestly, now that you bring that up, if I would have sat back with a little more confidence and going, okay, I'm going to, you know, anticipate this, but I'm putting myself on the finish line <laughs> and going to win this race. Um, that would have been a whole different ending, I think. But I didn't because I, w- I went in there blinded, not knowing the environment and going, Poof. next thing you know, it fell apart. So you went into it thinking that your your success was going to translate into that other place. This let's let's talk about this for a second because yeah. it's a word that confused me for a while. Right. I saw it first and I was like, that's not even a word. And it was the word called hubris. And hubris means that you think you're going to succeed at something because you succeeded at something else before. And you're applying that. And this is where a lot of business owners, I fell victim to this. Take us into that place of, I mean, were you just thinking like, hey, I'm going to go into real estate and like, uh, I mean, there's, there's got to be a bit of confidence in you at this time. I'm the best in the world. So I'm going to go into real estate and I'm going to be the best in the world. Is that what, where, you, where you took it? How can a person caution themselves or, or, or work through that and help them? Although we want to translate the confidence into something, right. but not <laughs> think that you're going to get the exact same result. How, how does a person shift as far as mindset that way? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one there because um, how, can, how, could, how could I have done it differently? Uh, yeah, going back, I would have said, you know what? I need, I need to have a little more... Um, I think it's about having the right people to have your back to, you know, a lot of times, you know, I think having the right connections, um, but then also uh, knowing what you're stepping into. You got to, you got to have some, uh, I had a lot of, I had a lot of experience in doing what I did to get where I was on that level. So, um, and then I thought I could just step into something with no (laughs) experience and expect that to be, and and, and, and I think if I would have continued on in that, uh, in that field, it would have eventually got to that level but that beat me down so um having that have being said um it's it's like when you find that and you're and you're like i want to go in that direction be be prepared to get beat down mm. be prepared to go okay you know what this this doesn't this isn't looking but you know what i still think nothing's going to stop me if you it, now if, in in hindsight if you would have applied the joe steiner um, blueprint for uh, winning by a nose, which we talked about, calm in your brain, seeing the end, right? Seeing yourself finish outside your own body. Right. Laying back, preferably third, like you said, knowing when to pounce, knowing what's under you, knowing what you got inside you, pouncing, and then celebrating the victory, but not getting too high. If you would have applied that in the real estate, or in going into a business, would that blueprint, what, where would that not work? Yeah, I think that would work pretty much anywhere. I believe so too. I think it'd work anywhere because no matter what we do, no matter who, and we come across a lot of wide variety of, of people in all different, let's say in, in the, in the horses, in the horse world dialect, or there are different types of horses, there's different types of people we're all going different directions and we all have these skills so um and and i think everybody's always going for the same thing you know we want to have that we're all looking for that that high but we don't want to i think that that high that comes along with success and doing something we love to do or we've we've been so fortunate to find that it's not everybody can find that so um helping people to find that and, and get into that 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 place mm. where we can we can get there to that that level. Um, that's why we do th- groups like uh, Secret Knock. I mean, Secret Knock brings uh, all these brilliant minds together, and everybody's trying to help each other take it to another level and and be bring out your best and whatever whatever that may be. Cause well, I think the the community in Secret Knock honestly needs to needs to hear that though. They need to hear the the Jockey Joe. Uh, blueprint. And when I said it I, the, in, in step two, it wasn't just seeing or like understanding the victory. It was like going into the mindset of what you talked about, going into the mindset that there's only one reason why we're doing this thing and this to win. Yes, so sir. when we calm our brain, we go into a winning mind state, right? <laughs> and then we envision the win and then we lay back and then we know when to pounce, knowing what's under us, knowing what's inside of us. Then we pounce. When we pounce, 
then we hit that by a nose. We celebrate. Don't go too high or too low. We give it away to others, and then we go back into a calm mind state and repeat the process. I mean, the reason why I was asking you who wouldn't, like I'm thinking about it in every single business owner that I know, every single person out there, if, if you were able to apply those things, Joe, I mean, you're an absolute genius. If you were able to, like if a person was able to just listen to you and apply, there's not a thing that they wouldn't be able to accomplish. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, really, it's, it's, it's that. I mean, it's, and if you, could, if you can experience this process, and no matter what you're doing, and, you're, and, you're, and then now that you've, you've felt this, man, this is good. I'm going to make this contagious. And maybe, maybe you're not the type to make this contagious. Maybe you just need to experience it yourself. But um, I, think, I think now is the time to, to share that with other people and bring everybody up to this level that the, the people that can relate to this because um, the I, I think we're we're meant to help others. I think we're meant we're meant to help others feel that feeling and go, man, you know what? This is this is what life's all about. I, I wanna I wanna help you feel like that and, and and keep creating more of that for people instead of I feel it but I don't want you guys to feel it. I'm not gonna share that with you guys. <laughs> Um, I want I want other people to feel that I want other people to go. Gosh, you know this is this is awesome. I mean, it's way awesome, but I'm just gonna feel like it's awesome. Well, let's let's keep it in perspective out there. Yeah. If you're watching or you're, I mean, because not every single person is gonna feel the highest high, but you could feel higher than where you're at, and you can feel it in your realm. And for those of you listening or watching, and you're seeing Joe, and you're saying, "Oh my gosh, I see this blueprint," and then you go out and you try it for the first time, and it doesn't work exactly like at the highest level. Realize what Joe just talked about, and what you just talked about, which was when you did real estate. What you did learn is that you took a lump, but if you would have applied that to horse racing, you took a lot of lumps when you first started out. Yeah. You didn't jump to the top. It was just time, and it was the commitment inside of it. So, Joe, I, I started the podcast because of my two kids. You got to, I think you've got a chance to meet Maddox. I did. Um, he's been around. He's 12 years old now. He just had a birthday. Um, marches to the beat of his own drum. I got McKenna, who's 14, in high school now. Scary. Absolutely beautiful wow. woman. She's taller than my wife. And she, honestly, like, sometimes when we go places, people think that it's my wife. Um, <laughs> so it's scary. She's yeah. in the arts and uh, acting, singing, she's unbelievable, got a, a phenomenal personality, tons of love in her heart. Um, I started the podcast because of those two individuals, and I, because I wanted them to never worship idols. I wanted them to be inspired by icons like yourself. So what advice would you have for Maddox and McKenna, and if you could use both their names and call yourself Uncle Joe, it would be awesome. Yeah, so this is Uncle Joe, Maddox, and, and what's... McKenna. McKenna. Maddox and McKenna, I mean, if you if you are so blessed like I know you are being with your father, stay with with your dreams and, and if you if feel like, you know what, I this is something I love to do, work towards it. Work towards it and, and you know, I know your dad's gonna support you no matter what, but um, just feel that that nothing can stop you because even if you're very mediocre at it and, and you decide maybe I shouldn't do this stick with it because uh, I mean like like me nothing was going to stop me just have that if you have that feeling like nothing's going to stop you nothing will stop you Joe it has been an absolute pleasure I mean for me what I've wanted to do is again I've wanted to go after the most iconic people in the world I mean we have the number two in the world I think you're the number one because I haven't met number one um, and I don't think he exists so to me Jackie Joe is the number one uh, jockey in the world. That's that's the way I see it, and that's the way what I know <laughs> you are. Um, but it, it's amazing because I keep getting the chance to be able to what I say that every single person out there that's uh, listening and watching, I'm going to force you to be my friends. I'm going to force uh, Jackie Joe to be my friend for the rest of your life. And when that happens, I don't have to be in a rush for anything. I don't have to worry about, okay, what are we going to do tomorrow together? No, it's we're going to be friends for life, and there's gonna, we're going to contribute. Um, the cool thing is, is what we created, there were so many people that were asking about the podcast and saying, can I be a fly on the wall? Well, you can digitally, like you're listening to or, or, or watching now. And if you're watching on YouTube, you should subscribe, because then my 12-year-old uh, son will think I'm cool. 
but what we created is a, a, an environment called the Vibe Room. And the Vibe Room is a live podcast like this where you, everyone out there, every one of you guys out there could be in the, uh, in the room with Jackie Joe and meet him and get this chance to spend time with the number two Jackie, number one in my book, in the whole entire world. And you would get a chance to be able to touch and feel and, you know, greet him, connect with them, things like that. We created that in the Vibe Room and we're having that actually in two days. It's sold out in Salt Lake City, so you can't go even if you wanted to. Um, but it's something in the future, Joe, that I would love to have you at because I think there's so many people that need to hear your story. There's so many people that need to read the book, so you need to write the damn book. Write the book, Joe. Know, we need the book. Like everybody needs that, and we just need more of Joe. I want to thank you so much, seriously. I mean, it has been an absolute pleasure. I want to thank your wife. She's here in the studio, your son, for taking the time, and you guys driving down and being here live with me. It has been absolutely phenomenal and the the light that you shine on other people man is is absolutely tremendous no thank you and i and and i want that to i mean i want that to come through i want i want people to feel that and and i need places like this experience with you that you bring kelly that that i can share that with other people and maybe hopefully somebody will be affected and go wow all right you know what and and that that actually resonated with me and i and i feel something so. Well, Joe, you're very humble because every single person that listened to even one word of what you were saying or got to see your face on YouTube, every person was impacted. Your wife was impacted. Your son is in the room right now. He's impacted. You have no idea how much a couple of words or a couple of uh, you listening, because you listen better than anyone that I've ever talked to, um, because you're actually intently there, which I think is amazing. Um you know, so I, I look forward, I, you know, those of you out there, we're going to have all his links in the bio um, also of the uh, of the episode. I want to thank every single person out there that's been listening and watching that's helped us to get in the top 1% globally of all podcasts. And it's not because we put out ads or anything like that. It's because you guys listened, you shared, and you subscribed. And I want to thank you for that. Um, and Joe, I just, again, I want to thank you. I want to thank your family. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to have you on the uh, show again. So, do me the favor. Look into the camera there. Talk uh, into the camera right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look into that one. Um, and tell the people what's next for Joe. Well, what's next for me is I'm going to continue on creating more of these, these, these moments that I can share and hopefully I can inspire other people um, in their hearts and so that they can make that contagious. Um, I'm also going to share my Beamer stuff that I do. Um, to help with your health, with your blood circulation. So these are things that I can share. Um, your physical body, your mental, your soul, these are all um, the, the things that we need to work on and um, help yourself, number one, so that you can help other people. And guys, remember the Jockey Joe blueprint, and here it goes. Calm your mind. Go there to win. See yourself finishing. When you start off, lay back. Don't uh, exude, all, or exude all your energy. Take a look at the playing field. Know what you got and know when to instinctually pounce. Then pounce. When you do, know what's under you. Know what's inside of you. And then win by a nose. And when you win by a nose, celebrate, but not too much. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. And then turn it back to a calm mind and share it with other people. That's right. Joe, you've been an absolute pleasure here and I want to, uh, again, I want to thank you. And you're officially off the hot seat. Wow.